thing. This next panel is called Real Estate in a World of Disruption and Uncertainty. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the panel's moderator, Karen Hortzman. Karen's the head of acquisitions for Allianz Real Estate of America. Uh, as the world's largest real estate investor, Allianz manages $76.4 billion global portfolio of debt and equity. Before joining Allianz, Karen worked for Norges Bank Investment Management, Norway's $1 trillion government pension fund, which as you all know is a major investor in real estate around the globe. While at Norges, Karen helped to build this U.S. real estate platform and its $22 billion U.S. portfolio. Before she was at Norges, Karen worked for Mayor Bergman Capital Partners, where she helped co-launch its real estate private equity fund. Karen started her career in London uh, with the Goldman Sachs Real Estate Principal Investment Group. Karen serves on the Board of Directors and Executive Committee of the Association of International Real Estate Investors, AKA um, AFIRE, the Governing Board of Trustees, the Foundation Investment Committee, and the Urban Development Mixed Use Council Bronze of ULI, and the New York Women Executives in Real Estate Scholarship Committee. Karen holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Science in Finance from where else, MIT. So please join me in welcoming Karen. So um, I'm going to do very brief introductions because I assume that everyone in this room knows who is on our rock star panel today. Um, so we're living in an unprecedented low rate environment. We all know that. And there's lots of capital that's still knocking on the door of real estate. So with the evolution of technology, which we've just heard lots about, and a dramatic shift in how people interact with bricks and mortar, the sectors are completely transforming and investors are having to adeptly maneuver and find um, where they can make some wins still. So, as we know, some of the people on our panel are the largest owners of real estate in the world, leaders in their field, clearly. And today we're gonna dive into how they're working to stay ahead of the curve and where they see the dangers and opportunities. And so rather than going through their bios, you have them, um, I'm going to just say who they are and we're gonna do a quick lightning round to start this off. So Sandeep Mathrani, CEO of Brookfield uh, Properties Retail Group and Vice Chairman of Brookfield Properties, former CEO of GGP. So to start this lightning round off, it's challenging to stay on top of everything that's happening around us. So my first question is, what, what's the first thing you read each day? Uh, Women's Wear Daily or the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Good. Um, Depending on what time it comes out. <laughs> if we wrap up to midnight, the Women's Wear Daily comes out first, so I read that first. If I wake up at six in the morning, the Wall Street Journal's in my inbox. That's great. Um, so what's the area of disruption that keeps you up at night? Uh, last mile of distribution. Fair enough. Um, and what, are, what is the area that you're most excited about? Curation of shopping centers, bricks and mortars here to stay. Okay, nice. <laughs> we'll see if we all agree with that. Do you expect yeah. anything less? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, and now a curveball one. At this point, who, uh, who else on this panel would you love to step into the shoes of for one day? Oh, come yeah. on. Get uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not falling. We're daily. <laughs> By the way, anyone but me. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Okay, next we have Deb Cafaro, Chairman and CEO of Ventus for two decades now. Um, so first, what's the first thing you read each day? Uh, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Excellent. What keeps you up at night in the area of disruption? Lately, it's been this liquidity repo market that uh, mm. has been acting strangely and whether it's a harbinger of something else. Fair enough. And what are you most excited about? life science, gene therapy, mm -hmm. incredible medical and uh, life science breakthroughs. Yes, it's an exciting area and people are really starting to catch on, <laughs> finally. <laughs> um, uh, so Kathleen McCarthy, uh, Senior Managing Director and Global Co-Head of Blackstone Real Estate. What do you read each day to stay on top of things? <laughs> 
my email. I'm just being honest. I know all the studies say when you wake up, you're not supposed to look at it. You're supposed to take control of your day. Um, but the reality is I find my stress level stays lower if I can kind of look. There's a lot of newsletters, but there's also a lot of content from our team around the world that I mm -hmm. like to kind of touch base with before I get going. Sounds good. And what is the one thing that keeps you up at night in the area of disruption? Uh, I'm not so sure it's in the area of disruption, but I think it's a disruptor, which is just global populism uh, and what that means for us as real estate mm -hmm. investors, particularly uh, in the areas of, of residential housing, which is a compelling theme for us. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will, I'll skip that last question. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot here. Well, I want to be Deb for a day. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be Deb for a day. I mean, yeah. you've had, she's had like an amazing investment track record for her whole career in the last two decades at Ventas. She seems very comfortable in her own skin. She's a positive person. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> in those shoes. <laughs> Comfortable nice. to a minute. I know, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. She bought them in a store. <laughs> I did. Oh, that's good. I did. Uh, so next we have Len O'Donnell, President and CEO of USAA Real Estate. So to stay on top of things, what do you read? Uh, I start with uh, Bloomberg. I, I, I go online, I read the five things you need to know today. I look at, there's, there's usually a pretty diverse range. Today there was a great piece on interest rates and, and the like. So I think that gives you a flavor. And I like, I, I settled there because it's the least political thing I've found. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very true. Mm -hmm. um, and what is, what's keeping you up at night lately? I, I think it's your opening comments, right? The wall of capital. Mm -hmm. This low interest rate and this incredible flow of capital in our industry which gives and takes, and, but it's impact on returns and sort of mm -hmm. concerns about inflated asset values across all spaces. Mm -hmm. And what are you most excited about now? So I think it's hard to say most, but I think the thing I'm, I'm spending a lot of personal energy on is I think as an industry, we're finally looking at ways, partly the last speaker, but we're looking at ways to, to modernize construction, to use technology to drive down construction costs. And I think, you know, I think it's something, it's a really important issue both for our industry, but also for things like housing. We're really focused on how to deliver housing more affordably, because mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's a critical, critical issue in our country. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah, and hopefully we'll and we're have actually, we're, we got a long way to go, but people are, we're actually focused on it as an industry for the first time. I mean, mm -hmm. I usually joke, we, we haven't changed how we build a house in 150 years, right? You know, except we use a pneumatic hammer now. Mm -hmm. you know, that's about the only difference, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, yeah. it's coming. Very true. Well, so as Len said, it's the first thing he reads each day. He forwarded me an article from Bloomberg this morning about the low interest rate environment, worth a read. Um, and they say that it seems we're at the beginning of the longest period of sustained negative interest rates. That's not surprising with what we're seeing. You see $17 trillion of negative interest rate holdings. And it's already persisted for quite some time. We've had US 10 years uh, at less than three, three and a quarter for the last eight years. LIBOR is expected to average only 1.2% over the next five years, and the Fed's expected to cut again by the year end. Um, we also have low growth. So uh, global growth forecasts have reduced from 3.7% in just July to 3.2%. So Len, I'll start with you. Is this, is this environment going to continue? Like, is this the Japanification of the US? Um, or the globe. Yeah, I, I don't love that word because I think there's different demographic factors in the U.S. and Japan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we actually have population growth, um, and I think that's part of that Japanification. But I, I have come around to the view, and I'll explain what I mean by that, too, that we are in this low interest rate mm -hmm. environment for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And when I say came around to it, and, you know, in 2014, 2015, I was, you know, even accused of being negative because I was preaching that interest rates were going to go up and that we'd be looking at, you know, maybe a 10-year in the threes by now and mm -hmm. cap rates would follow a bit. And, I mean, interest rates did go up, right? We, we tend to forget that. They actually did go up a couple hundred basis points. And I do think we had a little bit of a correction in pricing in 18. Uh, but I think now when you look at it, just the things you just described, there's no growth. Um, there's this wall of capital. There's negative interest rates. And I think the other thing that I've really come around to is, is our central bank, if you believe it is independent, it's supposed to be independent, it's uni somewhat unique in the world. That m many central banks are effectively arms of the government. So as governments are accumulating massive amounts of debt, 
in slow growth economies or negative growth economies or shrinking populations, there's simply no incentive to push um, interest rates up and there's no growth to support the need for it. So I think, I do think we're in a, um, in this for the long haul. And, uh, you know, and you mentioned negative interest rates. That article I sent you talks about the fact that we're really in negative real interest rates in the right. U.S. right, right. now. Right. You know, and, and I think that's something we don't focus much on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not something you hear. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and how is it changing the way that you look at returns? Um, well, I think I could take the rest of the panel, so I won't on this, <laughs> but I think we have to, as an industry, realize that an industry that was built, when I got the business 35 years ago, it was a nominal return business. You got a 20 for doing this, you got a 15 for doing this, and you got a 10 for doing this, mm -hmm. right? Yes, there were 20s once. Um, <laughs> you, you know, and today I think we have to look at ourselves as a relative return industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the wall of capital and low interest rates, I mean, today, a 12 is a thousand over the riskless rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, real estate has not historically produced a thousand over the riskless rate. Mm -hmm. And it's, today it's pretty consistently producing six, 700 mm -hmm. over the riskless rate, right? And that's historically high. So I think we have to have a sort of a shift um, and we can get into it later on data, but I think we're in an, in an industry that's less volatile moving forward because of data and technology and those things. So I just think there's, there has to be an, an industry-wide shift away from how people are incentivized and, and how they're compensated and the like based on a nominal, re a nominal return world. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we've talked about the wall of capital. There is a staggering amount of capital uh, waiting to get into real estate. And real estate allocations broke the 10% barrier last year, uh, not surprising given what you've just said. And so that means investors generally remain about 90 to 100 basis points underinvested in real estate. There's about, according to different estimates, around $340 billion of dry powder. Um, that doesn't count the undeployed capital that could potentially come to U.S. real estate from Japan. Mm -hmm. And private fundraising, I heard a stat, you, you would know better than I, um, <laughs> is, is up to about $500 million to a billion dollars a month. Uh, so with all of this capital... That's only for Blackstone. That's just at Blackstone. Yeah, that's just, so <laughs> can, you, can you update the number? Some of it, some of it sprinkles it out to the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. so then Kathleen, okay. Um, case in point, Blackstone's eighth flagship fund just raised 22, more than $22 billion. Um, what is the most significant influence on the investment landscape? impacted by these capital flows? How do you hold the door and, and still make good investment decisions? I'd say the benefit we have, particularly you're referencing our, our ninth opportunistic fund, I think the benefit we have in those structures, those opportunistic targeted returns is, is kind of twofold. One is that there is not time pressure to put out the capital. And I would say I really admire also our investors for recognizing that as we invested the capital or as we raised the capital rather. Um, people were not focused on, well, what are you going to do right now at the end of 2018 or 2019? The conversation was you know, over the next five years, do we think you have the discipline and patience to find the right moments and select the right opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we had the good fortune of doing this for a very long period of time and being able to demonstrate that we've had that kind of discipline when it was warranted. So our, our capital is constructed not to create that kind of pressure on the system. I think the other thing that is wonderful about private capital across all the different things we do is that we don't have to do any one thing or be effectively an index investor. We can go to where we think the best opportunities are. And I think you know, to, to follow on to some of Len's comments about the interest rate environment, um, we certainly had been investing with an eye toward a higher interest rate environment. We are now settling into the fact that mm -hmm. all signs point to persisted low interest mm -hmm. rates. But truly in either one of those scenarios, we're trying to find where there's growth. And so we've had more concentration, I think you, you would say, in terms of our investment strategies globally than we saw certainly in the five years following the financial crisis when there was a distressed environment. We could buy a lot of different things across a lot of different sectors and not have to be, be you know, believing all that much, if you will, uh, and generating 20% return. So we, we've just, we, we use the term probably ad nauseum in our organization, narrowing the aperture to the things that we like the best mm -hmm. to generate the returns we want to for our clients. Picking your areas of growth, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so generally speaking, we're, we're in this lower environment. You can find the pockets of growth, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But broadly speaking, do investors need to lower their, lower their return hurdles? 
I mean, if you're asking me, I think the answer is yes. Um, I mean, in reality, as Len said very clearly, that the spreads are dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, so you can either grow by lowering your thresholds or have a growth business. And we're not really in a growth business. We're all in pretty much mature industries. Uh, and when you compare to FANG stocks, you're not growing like FANG stocks, so have FANG returns. So effectively, you know, it's a question of how secure do you feel that your flow of cash flow is. Um, so I think the hurdles have come down. Even even the opportunity returns have come down. Um, you know, there's more core, core plus funds. And so the returns are definitely lower, but still healthier than they've ever been in our industry. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have um, low future growth. We're seeing a drag on the economy now from the trade uncertainty. And macro indicators are still positive, right? 70% of the US economy is driven by the consumer, and the consumer is still doing tremendously well. Um, so Deb, while not in the realm of possibilities just at the beginning of the year, there's even an argument to be made about cap rate compression, or yes. where are we going? And maybe it is strategy specific, as Kathleen mentioned. Well, I think in a couple of comments on growth, I think the, the economists over the last five years have exactly predicted the kind of environment that we're in. And I do think there are just structural factors in the US economy that are leading to this lower growth, including demographics, which all of the economists have said it will bring down the US growth rate by at least a percentage point in the go forward environment. And then yes, we have been growing unlike Japan, but most of that population growth has been through immigration. Absolutely. And so we have put now a damper on immigration, both legal and illegal. And that is another factor that is going to bring down growth in the US albeit I think we'll still stay in positive territory for the near term. But all of that, of course, affects the, the, the capital expectations. As Sandeep said, return expectations have definitely come down, yet they are very consistent or even good compared to the risk-free rate versus historical levels. Right. And as a result of that, I do think you are still seeing some cap rate compression. And I think that cap rate compression is exaggerated in certain sectors where you either see growth um, or you see a really strong stability to the cash flows. And we see that in our business. We're in five verticals at Ventas. We see the growth more in the life science and research and innovation space. We see the stability, for example, in medical uh, office buildings and outpatient where you have this really steady eddy type de great demand from consumers but a very utility like growth rate very sticky very stable and in both of those areas you see tremendous demand we also expect to see growth in senior housing after a period of some mismatch in supply and demand and we're seeing a lot of capital flowing into that space as well. So cap rates, yes, are compressing, and in some areas will continue to compress, assuming rates, the risk-free rate, stays low. Yeah. No, it's very interesting that these niche sectors are becoming so much more institutional. People are catching on yes. to what you've been doing. Well, you know, I would yeah. just say that I said 20 years ago, and I'll say again, healthcare is 20% of the U.S. economy. It's a huge sandbox. So I think of it as a really core part of the real estate business. And we're just now kind of getting that message out finally 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it's impressive. Uh, it's a, been a good run. Um, all right, so we're talking about specific sectors, and where do you find those pockets of growth? Uh, so let's dig in a little bit. We have sector specialists here, so let's find out what they think. Um, something we've talked about on the panel, we're seeing obsolescence in virtually every sector. Mm. It's, you know, yes, we're late in the cycle, but things are really reinventing themselves. Uh, major sector shifts, and retail <laughs> is <laughs> at the top of people's mind when we think about that. And, Portland. you know, Sandeep's been immersed in the retail world at Forest City, Vornado, GGP, now, now running um, Brookfield. So over a long period of time, you've seen the good, bad, and ugly of the retail world um, and have successfully navigated ahead of the curve. So while it's reinventing itself, you could say experiential, mixed-use logistics, 
it's still getting beat up in the public markets. So I'd like to know from the audience, do you think that that's justified, that there is a penalty in the public retail sector versus the private or not? Who thinks that it is justified that it should be discounted? You should sell some okay. stock today, Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. Warm audience for you. <laughs> so, Sandeep, what do you think, and, and how do you stay ahead of the curve here? You, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that old is new again. I'm also a big believer, obsolescence is my favorite word, uh, and I always like to guide people that there's obsolescence in every industry. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a focus of the retail business. Uh, if I ask people, do they use smartphones, everyone's going to sit back and say yes, or so what happened to Nokia, Blackberry. If I say, do you do search, they say of course, or what happened to Yahoo. If I say, do you use email, they say yes, or what happened to Hotmail. So my point is, it doesn't matter what industry you are, okay, you have to stay ahead of the curve. You think about iPhone, iPhone's only been around 12 years. I mean, just to think about how short a period of time that is, it's actually shocking. And so there's nothing different if in our industry. In our industry, we're overbuilt or under demolished. Uh, we've been that way for <laughs> as long as I know. By the way, in 19, in, in, the series, in all seriousness, in 1994, I used to walk around with a placard, and it just used to say, US retail per capita, 19 square feet per person. Invest with us at Forest City in the boroughs of New York City, where the retail square feet per person is three square feet per person. Right, and we build amazing shopping centers. They're still around. They're still, you know, Madison Market just bought the Forest City portfolio that, that I built. It was fantastic. Uh, and today, that same placard says that retail real estate in America is 24 square feet per person. Good retail real estate in America is four square feet per person. So, you know, there's a huge delta between four and 24. And let me put that in perspective. That's 8 billion square feet at 24 and 1.3 billion square feet at four, and I own 100 million square feet of the 1.3 billion square feet. So we sit in a really good place. We've never had a better year. Retail leasing has been almost one and a, one and a half X my average. Spreads continue to be high single digits, and sales productivity is the highest it's ever been in our portfolio, up over 5%. And this is bricks and mortar. And still, at the end of the day, 85% of all retail sales happens in bricks and mortar, 15% happens e-commerce, and really, companies don't really talk about the difference. So the effective is to try not to be obsolete, invest in your real estate, you know, curate the shopping center with uses that you want. You could have great real estate, you know, I'm sure she bought those shoes at Northbrook Court at Neiman Marcus, or at least I hope she did. I did. Uh, okay. <laughs> I love to support you, Sunday. <laughs> there we go. So, you know, I mean, this is a shopping center in a fantastic a demographic. Center. Really, if you're from Chicago, but it has an Eman Marcus, it has a Louis Vuitton, but it doesn't work. And right. we're going to deploy almost $300 million of capital, tear down half the mall, rebuild it with uses that we think work for that community. We could sit here, do nothing, and watch this asset go to zero or do something and make a billion dollars, okay? And so you need, you need that courage to, 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 to recognize obsolescence and solve for it uh, and, and do whatever is appropriate for the asset. And so good balance sheet, good real estate, stay from obsolescence, uh, and we're constantly investing, constantly. And it's like a constant evolution. But the good news is we do make a rate of return. So this is not like this is you know, defensive without making a rate of return. Mm -hmm. And we've steadily made 7 to 10% unlevered return on our invested capital. Um, so it's all incremental and it's good. So uh, you know, we've, we've, we've been fortunate to have a good balance sheet and good real estate. So where do you think the um, square feet per person, where does that go to on a blended basis? So it's uh, four is very exciting. Yeah. You know, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, things last longer than people think they should last. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the people are always, uh, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid that they could buy something cheap and it'll last longer. But rightfully so, the number should be, in my opinion, about 15 to 18 square feet per person. And that's accounting for the delta of the amount of capital people spend 
uh, at retail compared to other places in the world. So you can't look at the UK at five and us at uh, 24 and say that makes any sense because the people in the UK spend one and a half times less than we do, right? So, so effectively you have to compensate for that and we want people to continue spending. As you said, 70% of the GDP is consumer spending, so it's really important for us to keep spending. So I would say, you know, call it you know, 15 to 18 square feet per person uh, mm -hmm. is probably where, it's probably the right touch point yeah. to me. So with the majority of the market at 24, that's a... Uh there's there's some headwinds for some of some parts of the market, but you seem to be but at that, the forefront but that's in, of the. I agree, but, but that's I think yeah. in every industry. That's in the hotel oh, yeah. industry. Yeah. That's in the restaurant and, and industry. So that so the poor Sandeep doesn't have to be the only one talking about retail. I'd say, you know, I think one of the challenges for Stop. the retail wow. industry is that the you know it's been painted with this whole big broad brush, and mm -hmm. like any of the types of things we do, you have to peel that away a little bit. So what he's talking about are you know, transformations of great assets to make them you know wonderful experiences for the consumer that wants to be there today that that definitely has a purpose you see that having a purpose all over mm -hmm. the country and you know I think interestingly other parts of the world have followed these lessons learned from our markets right when you think about the developing markets in India or China you have much more convenience oriented or experientially oriented assets mm -hmm. and I'd say restraint on how much square fit footage is getting built and so you know I think the story that was just discussed is in terms of square footage and everything is very much you know, U.S. mall story, but if you were to look elsewhere in the world or you were to look at community-based shopping centers in high density areas, you, you would start to feel, I think, a different story that gets back to what Sandeep was sharing about mm -hmm. kind of the relevant square footage to look at you know, for, for whatever segment of the market you're attacking. Yeah. It, it, you, I think you're going to go here, so I'll jump the gun a little bit, but it occurs to me with Kathleen's comments it's really this conversation is not at all unique to retail. It's just that malls are big. Everybody knows their mall, and it's sort of fun to beat up on, on malls, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look across your, our, our <laughs> portfolio, <laughs> everything, everything, probably with the possible exception of industrial or logistics, everything is becoming more experiential, right? You talk about it, the what do we, what is, uh, you know, we're doing a ton of office build a suit, right? What do we want? Corporate America wants. Um, buildings that help them compete in the war for talent, right? They're heavily amenitized. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they've got, you know, amazing facilities for their people and they're experiential and we're building basketball courts and shuffleboard courts and all sorts of things. And, and in apartments, you know, if we're not updating our apartments every five years, it's almost become like the hotel business. Mm -hmm. If we're not doing a res refresh every five years, that apartment project looks like it's 20 years old, right? You know, where I, I, I told somebody earlier, I, my guys came in to talk about a capital plan for an apartment project. And they put a bunch of pictures up, and these were new apartments recently built in Atlanta. And then they put a picture up with these, like what I thought were sort of old, tired kitchens. And I was like, so what is this? And they said, that's the project we built six years ago. Wow. Right? I mean, it just seemed like they were 20-year-old kitchens, right? And so I think you know, everything we're doing is, is becoming obsolete, obsolete faster. And um, I just think you know, malls have become the poster child for it to some extent. Yeah, and, and I, by the way, this was this was made at a at the Neiman we own together. So perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for it. La Cantera, you know, San Antonio. I feel like I'm the only person not shopping at this particular store. <laughs> <laughs> Canceling my afternoon meetings. Going straight there. <laughs> we'll get to you soon, too. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. The, the, the real estate is almost becoming living and breathing, and the, the way people use it is changing, and the pace of obsolescence, the pace of change is rapidly increasing. And so, as Sandeep said, doubling down and really investing in the areas of growth and staying ahead to make your product as best as it can be um, is the way to make money. Mm -hmm. So, um, Deb, I know, you know you've been in the healthcare sector for a long time, and that's been rapidly evolving, too. Yes. Um, wondering. What investments have you guys made that's been really motivated by staying ahead of the curve in that area? Mm -hmm. Well, our whole strategy over the last 20 years has been to grow and diversify and to stay, I would always say, just one toe ahead of the curve because you really don't have to be a visionary to do well. And in many cases, honestly, if you're too far out front, you, you fail. And so we have really tried to spot trends where we could make an investment thesis, where we could uh, uh, acquire a core 
set of really great assets and where we could really put our capital then behind growing that. And it really started uh, as we, we've gotten out of the nursing home business, which is a very, very difficult business. And it ebbs and flows, but it's ebbed a lot more than it's flowed over the last 20 years and continues just to be a tough business. We've swapped that out really with um, the medical office building business, which is a high quality, steady eddy business with great counterparties, mostly very high quality hospital partners that are growing in their markets, obviously go to the baby boomer demographic, um, which when people become Medicare eligible, all of a sudden they go to the doctor like five times more than everybody else. They retire and healthcare's free, so they use more of it. They have more time uh, and more access. So that's been a great business for us. We started investing in 09 and 10. Uh, we've subsequently, uh, we're the second largest owner of senior housing. That started in 07. That's a pri all private pay, consumer driven business that really plays to the over 80, over 85. Um, that, that cohort's going from 12 million to 20 million over the next couple of years. And then the last and most forward facing part of our business, we were lucky enough to acquire from Kathleen, which is a university-based research and innovation business, life science, so our tenants are now Yale and Brown and Penn, and it's a great convergence of medicine, where we've always played a role, uh, life science, where they're developing these uh, treatments for disease almost Half the country will have some chronic disease by 2030. Doesn't that sound great? But we'll be there to help. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, it's really just a, a very exciting business and, and having, uh, uh, doing business with these universities and really doing, herb, it's really urban renewal. Um, it's these knowledge communities where there are students scientists, doctors, and so on. It's just a really exciting part of our business and we'll play to the longevity thematic as well. So um, out of the nursing home business into life science, that's been a great trade yeah. for Ventas. Yeah, and I mean, $1.5 billion, I think, commitment to the research, to research and innovation. It's, um, it's exciting to think about what's ahead in those. Yes, areas. yes. Um, but it's not always easy to see. Right, so no. when you're at the start of the curve, um, I appreciate what you say, you can't go too far, but even going in the right direction, figuring out what pockets, uh, where, yes. where do you wanna be? Um, and so Len, I'd like to ask you, everyone is excited about logistics now. And very early on, USAA uh, met a bet on Amazon when everyone else still said it was junk bond credit. So what do you think you saw then that the broader market didn't see? Well, for the record, it was junk bond credit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, look, it's, I don't want to say that we were like incredibly prescient. We, we hedged our bets as we started in that relationship. Um, you know, I got to USA in 11, just as that relationship was starting to build. Um, and we had a ton of industrial DNA. It was sort of our core activity. Uh, you know, we were an industrial before Kathleen made it cool, but um, <laughs> so, it but, might have made something cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but but so look, we we started using that DNA, right? So we built, we we put funding caps. They were building, remember, in those days, in places that were purely driven by tax. So we built in places like uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and Spartanburg, South Carolina. So we knew there was liquidity in the space. There was huge liquidity from the private REIT market at that time. Uh, we tested that regularly. And you know we were a much smaller business then. I mean, we've grown five times since those days. So we, were, we would do three or four of them at a time, and we'd exit them, and we'd make some money. And, and if I was really smart or really had the right capital, and we were building them at 11s, we might have held them for a while. But you know we were selling them at 9s, so it was a really good business. Um, but then what happened was we kind of went to school on them. We really started to treat them like a partner and they started to treat us like a partner. And they would come to us every year with next year's plan and next year's vision. And my team made a really strong case that e-commerce was here to stay. And what we figured out was while everyone was talking about the fact that they weren't making a profit, 
we didn't really view it that way. If you really got into the business, you saw that they were using their profits to grow their business right. and to build what we thought was potentially an impenetrable wall for others to catch up to them because of the amount of money they were mm -hmm. spending. And they were spending about 50-50 with us as they went because they were basically building out the inside and we were building the outside in the early days. And then you know, it just continued to expand and they've been a, an amazing partner because they remember that we were there then. Mm -hmm. Right, so we don't get everything we want, but we have a really good relationship where we get a view of what we do want going forward and what we decide to do or not decide to do. But the bigger bet probably was in like, I'm, losing, I'm a little fuzzy, but maybe 13 or 14. We just made, they started changing the model, right? They started adding mezzanines, they started adding conveyors, then the robots came. And we just made a decision as a firm that we were going to do whatever they wanted to do because whatever they did was the future of e-commerce. And that has served us really, really well to the point now, you know, we're building, you know, three million square foot, four story warehouse buildings and, and liquidity has followed, right? And, you know, you guys own a bunch of them. And, and um, I think that, it, you know, somewhere in there, there was one fun part is, is I, will, I will say this, you, you know, we also started to understand what the cloud business meant to them. And we started to realize that the cloud business was going to dwarf the retail business eventually. Mm -hmm. And, and I was actually spoke on a panel in Cologne in 2013 or 14, and I said, just, you know, those things you say on panels, right? I said, <laughs> I said they were 150, I think they're the 155th largest company in America, and I said on the panel, we were talking about Seattle and Amazon, and I said, someday they may be the largest company in the world. And the keynote speaker that day is an extremely well-known, you know, legend in our business, so I won't mention his name said in his speech, you know, I, I agree with Lynn about Seattle and I love Amazon too, but they're never going to be the largest company in the world. So we made sort of a little fun bet. And for the record, they were the largest company in the world for about an hour last year. So I think did I won the bet. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that part, but, but you know, we don't really, we haven't had as much activity with, with, you know, the cloud business as we probably would like to, but that's emerging as well. And, and now, you know, we're following them into the last mile. I mean, they're going to, mm -hmm. you know, sorry, Cindy, but, you know, they're going to, you know, make a huge push in the last mile, and we're just going to make a bet on that as well. So. They're going to buy a mall company. What's that? They're going to buy a mall company. It could be. Could be. You know any in particular? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'm putting in my buy order now. <laughs> no, that, that, it's, it's a fascinating space, and uh, you were an early mover, and so now... Kathleen, I'll move on to you because we're talking about logistics. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Blackstone has made has struck a lot of wins betting on leading trends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably that the market doesn't broadly see yet. And now you've just doubled down on logistics, eighteen point seven billion dollars in GLP. At this point in the cycle and with everyone catching on, yields as they are, where do you see the value and where do you see this going? I, I, first I'd step back and say generally what what Len described is what we always try to do, which is to say, what is happening in the world, mm -hmm. or what are we seeing from our tenants mm -hmm. that we can then put into a real estate context, right, in, in what we're doing. That's how we ended up in, in the life science business, actually, was mm -hmm. basically looking at the world and saying, huh, things have totally changed in office. Mm -hmm. All the demand is coming from these tenants that were kind of the backwater for most of our careers, um, places people you know, didn't want to invest or were afraid of the quote-unquote over-improvement, and suddenly you realized, the, the funding of the life science business, the future of medicine was fundamentally changing the demand for that kind of space. So that was a, a kind of looking outside of the real estate envelope to say, what can we do with that in real estate? I'd say what's happening in logistics is the same thing. And since the financial crisis, we've purchased uh, nearly a billion uh, square feet of, of warehouses around the world. But it hasn't been the same kind of billion for a decade. There's been a lot of shift in where our focus has gone to, and GLP is an example of this, of really moving in more and more to that quote unquote last mile, mm -hmm. uh, or in Europe it's sometimes the last 20K. What, whatever it takes essentially to get goods from a retailer, often it's Amazon, but other people as well, to get a good to you in a matter of hours not days. And what's so interesting to us and why we still feel like this whole logistics world has a lot of room to run is that for retailers, transportation costs far outweigh their real estate costs. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, effectively it's something like you know, 10 to one or something like that, or maybe more extreme in certain places. And so there is room for rents to increase 
And especially in those closer in locations in urban areas, there's very limited new construction. We can't imagine that's changing. You know, cities are not so excited about having warehouses <laughs> close in. It's especially not the 90 highest. foot tall ones. Exactly, exactly. It's not, it's, it's not attractive necessarily. It's not the highest taxpayer. Um, and so we don't see those supply de demand dynamics changing dramatically. And yet we see more and more tenants wanting to be in those locations with the capacity in their overall cost structure to pay higher rents. And so we continue to be really enthusiastic about that. And, and for us, that's really a global theme, right? All around the world, we're seeing higher penetration of e-commerce. We're seeing faster and faster delivery times. We're seeing innovation not just from retail, but uh, food uses as well. Um, today, we announced our European portfolio companies, uh, our urban logistics portfolios effectively rebranding and I was really pleased that the press picked up on the fact that a lot of the uses actually are now for companies like Deliveroo and other kind of food uses that are trying to provide kitchens for people who are serving food you know, out you know, into the community. As we all order in more and you think you're, you're calling a restaurant, you may not actually be calling a restaurant, you may be calling effectively a kitchen that is cooking that food in an offsite location. And so more and more uses and needs for this kind of last mile purpose. Uh, and we're just trying to use our scale to find ways to access those investment opportunities at a, attractive values. Right, so in logistics, the last mile, let's stick on that for one second. The physical attributes of the, of the buildings, how is that changing? Because people are using logistics in, in such a different way um, over a short period of time. Well, I'd say generally speaking, it's hard to find super attractive photos of them for our pitch books. Uh, <laughs> Beauty's in the eye. Yeah, I mean, again, this goes, maybe goes back to like people, you know, love seeing photos of, of big shiny buildings, but actually our greatest successes have been in maybe relatively unattractive uh, assets in those last mile locations. And so I'd say for the existing, a lot of the existing warehouses, that's what it looks like. But I do think what Len is talking about was what they're doing in their business in terms of um, going vertical, innovating the space, again, trying to think about what does the future of this look like, what, not what has it looked like in the past, and what does a large format look like in, an, in a city location, but rather kind of what's going to serve the purpose of our tenants. Yeah, and in the small format space, I think the biggest change that's underway right now is these facilities, you're talking about anywhere from 80 to 200,000 square foot facilities mm -hmm. with huge parking facilities for either structured or, or surface for the Sprinter vans. That's probably the ah. biggest change is we're buying, you know, we're, you know, we're needing to acquire sites that you know, are double or more of what they would have been to build that building. And the Amazons of the world are willing to pay for that to be part of their, you know, they're willing to pay for the FAR effectively in order to park the Sprinters. <laughs> and that's a big game changer and when you think about in urban areas, that that's not easy, right? right? To find you know that truly last mile where you can get all that parking. Mm -hmm. right. um, so I think that's one of the biggest part of the new model. Mm -hmm. um, so e-commerce, we're talking about retail. Um, I'll come back to. Remember, Sandeep, I said what pissed me up at night. I said last mile. Last mile. Yes, Just that's right. That. That's right. I said I was um, sorry. And, and you know, there's still a, a but, I, but, I, but, I, but I will say, you know, you, you sort of think about this whole thesis, and, I, the, and, and it's very interesting when you watch the companies that, again, who are trying to stay from obsolescence, going back to that word on the bricks and mortar front. You look at what Walmart has done, okay? Walmart has reinvented themselves uh, completely. They're a formidable com competitor, uh, as, we've, as, we, as we've seen. Uh, their e-commerce business has grown astronomically, and they're using their store network of 4,000-odd stores to be the last mile of distribution and doing it very successfully. So they are, there's enough of that, you know, you know obviously Target, uh, who, you know, we had an outside CEO come in, uh, and his first move was, let me invest $7 billion in the bricks and mortar. And the way he's handling, you know, last mile of distribution is opening these urban stores right in the heart. They've got six stores in Manhattan now, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of math that goes along with this, right? And I think Kathleen said this, the last mile cost from warehousing is 21%. The last mile cost in a mall for a retail store is 13.5%. And we can't forget return ratios. We can't forget the ability to upsell. I mean, the math is overwhelming, and everyone now talks about one commerce. They're both going to rise, okay? So, uh, in, in, in effectively, as long as we consumers want things overnight, 
people are going to have to start to figure out if we can convince you to buy online, pick up and store, that's the most profitable part of any retailer's chain. The next is ship from the store and the third is how do I get these urban you know, uh, logistic centers as close to the population as humanly possible to deliver. So talk about food a little bit like P.F. Chang's, you know, the entire growth pattern okay, is to open these sort of takeout joints, not these big 10,000 square feet stores. And so you don't need 400 seats anymore in a restaurant, you need 100 seats because you're doing a lot of delivery. Um, but if you can get the customer to come in and use that 100 seats, you're going to upsell them. And if not, you're going to use the same real estate to ship. So it, it's becoming interesting, um, you know, and, and effectively the question again becomes who can invest? Uh, you know, Amazon is opening, you know, stores of all different yep. varieties, sort of with bookstores. They've got these four-star stores now, Amazon Go stores. So, you know, they're testing different formats, again, to figure out how to handle the last mile of distribution. So I think the game is, I mean, what everyone said on this panel is last mile of distribution, whether you do it in the form of retail or logistics, it's, they all are going to converge sooner or later. Mm -hmm. That, that makes Do you think there's any political risk to Amazon given what's happening? Sorry. No. I, but given the seemingly concerted attacks on Amazon from both political and commercial players? Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to answer that question, yes. I mean, they talk about it. Um, I have a personal view that they have a lot of competitors, right? If you look at antitrust, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be monopolistic, and mm -hmm. everything Sandeep just said, they have competitors in every sector, okay. whether it's Google or, or, or Microsoft in the cloud, or whether it's Walmart and Target mm -hmm. in retail. So it's, it, to me, it's, a, it's hard to see how it's a monopoly. I mean, and for the most part, all they've effectively done is drive down prices for the consumer across right. the world. Um, and change the world. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah exactly, the in the meantime. Yes. But, you know, people don't like big conglomerate companies. Yes. Right? I mean, you know. Um, they own the Washington you know, remember Post. When eight, remember when it was unimaginable that AT&T was an AT&T, right? Mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's changing quickly. So sticking on evolution and, and how we're using technology in, in all of these changes. So as we heard earlier, there's been a tremendous uh, investment, a tremendous level of investment in prop tech. Um, my numbers were 18 billion last year, and that's just compared to 2 billion in 2016. Uh, so that's a tremendous increase. And it's really focusing on real estate as a service, how people are using the, you know, how people are experiencing retail, experiential, how people are, uh, where they're living when they get older, logistics, how they're shopping. So um, I'd like to talk about specific examples of how you're using technology to stay out of the curve. How are you using technology either across your portfolio or in specific investments? Um, I'll open that if anyone wants to take that one. I'll, I'll start. I'd say, um, and you kind of already said it, generally speaking, our use of prop tech is trying to make us better at our core business, not to become prop tech investors. Um, we will be open to and consider those ideas and opportunities as well, but more we're trying to have our teams and our portfolio companies really open to all of the new ideas coming at us from prop tech firms. And I'd say really what we've done with technology has spanned the, the gamut of things we do, everything from basically revenue optimization to energy cost analysis uh, and savings to a tenant engagement. Um, you know, we, we have the Willis Tower nearby here. We have, as many buildings now do, a great app that tenants can use to basically engage with other retail uses and service providers in the building to know what's going on in the building, for us to know the tenants are safe. Um, and I think it, it, some of this goes back to just expectations, um, you know, particularly as it relates to an app like that, of how our tenants expect to experience their, their work life and the community around them. And so um, we, we have just, rather than have you know, a technology person worrying about prop tech and things like this, tried to make it a bit more part of the culture and about driving great results and value creation the same way we do, you know, we would do just through kind of more regular way leasing mm -hmm. or capital projects and things like that. So I, I would sort of sit back and you know, add that we do the same in the sense we only invest where it sort of helps our core business and you could look at life differently and you can say we're all in the technology business with hard assets. Mm -hmm. And so hard to imagine that a company that owns retail has a whole data science 
uh, you know, the data scientists. We have, you know, many data scientists, about you know, 15, 20 people in the group. And today we can actually curate a shopping center knowing exactly what the potential of sale is of every category. In the, in the past, what we would do is if a retailer wanted a space, our job was to collect rent, and we would create this sort of almost cannibalization by having everyone under one roof, not really curating for the market, but you know, people's perception or the retailer's perception of what the market is. Today we don't do that anymore. Today we'll eventually know, we know exactly what the sales will be. If we're gonna cannibalize, we'll know exactly if we're gonna cannibalize, and, and, and the data is very powerful. So you can today build something that's sustainable uh, and, and be fairly accurate in your predictions on what retail sales will be, not relying on the retailer's own data analytics. Um, and so, uh, you know, so we use it, you know, aggressively, um, you know, in every aspect, EMS systems, you know, you, you know, we haven't spent a penny more in energy costs in seven years purely because of good EMS system, which is nothing more than technology, right? And so, uh, so I think, you know, it, it's amazing how, how part of our lives it is and, and, and it's, you know, we shouldn't be threatened by it, but use it, uh, you know, for the advantages that exist. Yeah, I'm sure you're enhancing the consumer and the tenant experience through technology. Just Tremendously. Telling people where to locate, how, how they can enhance their shopping experience. Well, you know, places like Hawaii, which I'll tell you a story, where you can't find labor, because it's light, very, light, very tight labor. So essentially, we have an app, essentially, where every employee, which is part-time, you know, can pick if they want to work two hours at Hermes or to work two hours at Louis Vuitton, they can sort of pick where they want to go based on their lifestyle, and they are all serving That's the luxury amazing. sector. And yes. so they can yeah. go and say, I work six hours here, and that doesn't work for me, so I'm going to go work six hours there. Oops. Uh, I keep but dropping we're things. We're not going to uh, that event. But, but, but it's kind of an interesting <laughs> way that to use labor, <laughs> and it's been very successful. Yeah. yeah. Very successful. Yeah. Um, we, our emphasis in technology is really less around property and more around people. So I agree with the data analytics. That's clearly uh, a big part of how we make decisions, including investment decisions. But a lot of the technology is really around health and wellness. So wearable devices to monitor people's conditions, telehealth even Alexa type devices to help seniors be more engaged. It's really about extending life and living a, a better, healthier life mm -hmm. while you're at it. So that's really where we're engaging most on technology. Yeah, healthier and happier. Yes, Good. that's the goal. Yeah, and so you touch, you're all touching on big data. Now big data is all the rage, everyone's talking about it and organizations are spending a tremendous amount of human capital and money basically figuring out how to collect it all and then how to organize it. <laughs> and I think companies are in various stages of figuring that out, frankly. Um, but then once we do all of that, we spent you know, two years on a certain project to organize this data and we look at it, what do you do with it? So how are you actually creating value? Is it investment decisions? Is it existing portfolio? Um, and, and Kathleen, I'll... I'll yeah, love to hear from you on this. So uh, when we talk about big data, I'll separate data we own effectively because mm -hmm. we have proprietary access to information about our portfolio and data we can now buy uh, across multiple different categories. Um, so in terms of the data we have from our portfolio, I actually think uh, this has been a core competency of ours for a long time. We just didn't have very high tech tools to do it. Right? Mm -hmm. We have a heritage right. of collecting all of our information, uh, cataloging, if, it, if you will, on dashboards and board materials, uh, and quarterly evaluation materials, all these things, and then we share it very broadly through the organization so that if you are investing in Australia and you're curious to know what's going on in Germany, and you can, you can access that and figure out if that has, has meaning in your market. And so I think we've been really good at that. I think what we have now, though, are better and better tools to basically put it into a, an effectively a data lake, a data source, um, and we've re and our team now recognizes the real value in creating consistency across that. You know, and mm -hmm. and like how are we defining square footage? How do we you know what are the various ways we define cap rates and what becomes relevant in in later collection of that data? And so and the goal of all of this is just to be able to look at data when you need it, um, and and to tell you 
Is your strategy working? Do you mm -hmm. need to pivot what you're doing, where you invest capital or how you revenue manage something? Is it time to exit? Is it time to buy more? And, and again, I think we're, as an organization, I'm proud to say I think we're pretty good at that. And just now we have more tools and we're going to be able to have more data you know, held in systems mm -hmm. and be able to produce it more easily. You know, unfortunately, even in recent history, if you wanted to know, um, you know how many retail assets do we have in a certain zip code, that would be a lot of manual labor for some folks on our team to retrieve that. And, and now I think we have the luxury of not having to do that. Separately, though, is the data you can buy. And I think that's so interesting. And we're just as, as private market investors at the beginning of understanding what that can do for us. Um, we had a, a, a funny case study where our data, basically a data science team, which is a shared resource across our firm, came to our team and said, you know, we can tell you some things about your assets you don't know. And, and of course, we were like, no, we know everything. Um, <laughs> and then um, and they said, and I'm going to mess up exactly what happened, but effectively they said, you know, you know, 80% of the customers of the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas go across the street to the CVS and spend $30. And we said, how could you possibly have figured that out? And he said, well, you can just buy credit mm -hmm. card data, right. and it can mm -hmm. tell you that, and that can help inform what, you know, how you take your asset, what you should, asset, sell, what you should sell in the Cosmopolitan Hotel. Sell, um, <laughs> maybe you should have a CVS on site, maybe you should put yeah. that you know, in the mini bar, whatever it is. And so that, that kind of thing, again, it's, it's more about making us good at our core business and better at it um, than kind of just having, I'd say, you know, general intellectual arguments. The thing that's really interesting to me about the discussion is I do think certain organizations were always made fact-based decisions and maybe you were good at collecting data and observing data, but it was so dependent upon a professional who was good at what they did to see the patterns and then make the leap from the patterns to action. And now it's um, that second step is done more uh, analytically more technology based. Mm -hmm. And so I think what a lot of the, the long timers who are expert at what they do, I think we hopefully saw most of those patterns from the data we were collecting and circulating, but this is a much better way to do it. It's much less dependent upon experience or a single person or just studying and, and just seeing those patterns. I used to see patterns sort of just jump up off the page. Mm -hmm. And now, um, really, they don't need me because they have all of these analytics who are, who are able to take the information. And that, to me, is the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, go back to the, the book machine platform crowd, right? Those decisions, the, the book is on the premise that those decisions were made by the highest, pri highest paid person in the room mm -hmm. instead of by the data, yeah. right? And, and so we took that to heart. Like Kathleen, we, we had, you know, had a really long history of capturing that data, but when we really made a big commitment to spend resources on it, we found that it was all in silos. Right? right, and it didn't. It mm -hmm. didn't. So we created this what we call life cycle, right? And we really focused on how to make sure that data lives in the system and, and informs everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. It's been a very iterative process, right? We start by started by organizing that data, which was a massive. We actually <laughs> called it something witty, like Project 2015. It was like in 2015 we're going to capture all this data, right? And we then we started building on it iteratively, and we we created sort of automated live business plans for every every asset we own, and and they they are you know a, a available to everybody in the organization 24/7. And then then we started saying you know then our data scientists and a couple of individuals who ran that business said you know how can we use machine learning to make us better, and um, we haven't gone really public with this, but so I guess I am a little bit today. But we we've built um, some some predictive analytic tools mm -hmm. that have, and the one thing I insisted is before we shared any of them with investors or anything else, um, that we would back that they would be back testable. Right. And I'll just say that we built a predictive analytic model that had remarkable success predicting from 2002 to 2017 everything, including the GFC downturn and recovery to the point that we have it in a color code system, right? It gives us red, yellow, green. And it was flashing bright yellow in mid-2006 and bright red at the end of 2006 and bright green in you know, the fall of 2008, mm. right? And so that sort of said, wow, we may actually be onto something. So now we're using that technology to, you know, for, for path of growth analysis, for income growth analysis, for r relative rents between assets, what we expect one asset's rents mm -hmm. to do. And so 
you know, as I explained to investors, we haven't thrown out our our team. We haven't thrown right. out those decision makers. Right. It still matters what side of the street you're on. It still matters whether you have the right partner. It still matters yes. if you have the right architecture. Okay, everyone. So I want to thank our panelists for being here today. We've had a really interesting discussion. Um, so to really sum it up, I'd say we've all seemed to agree that we are in a persistent low rate environment going forward, but there's still value to be had. And what becomes increasingly important is staying ahead of the curve and investing in the next big thing, investing in research and innovation in life science and senior living, reinventing retail into mixed use, making it more vibrant, making sure you're one of the winners that Sandeep talked about. On the logistics side, really seeing the trend. This is not stopping. E-commerce is here to stay. What do people demand? I want it now, I want it fast. Um, so really being equipped and, and choosing your spots to be equipped for the future. Um, I'd also say that I think there's a lot of talk about big data. I do think that there's still a lot to figure out what to do with it. But as Kathleen said, using that information and basically enhancing the value of real estate through that data is going to be an increasing trend. And, and that will prove, uh, provide us with some winners. So in short, thank you very much. This has been a fun discussion and I'm sure we'll dig into these topics more as the day continues. Thank you.